Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is the third part in our deep dive into the Prussian army. I was hoping it was going to be the last one, but I think we're going to have to have another one after this one. And we're going to have a look how she performed in the latter years of Napoleon's reign, starting in 1813. And we're going to end as we approach the Waterloo campaign. Now as I say, this is the third part. If you've not seen the earlier ones, then there's a few bits that you might find confusing. So I'd recommend listening to those ones first. But... But if you're happy just to jump in, or you've already heard those earlier parts, then let's get started. So when we left off in the last episode, Von York's army had surrendered to the Russians, and enthusiastically flipped to march against Napoleon. This soon became official government policy, and so, on the 1st of March 1813, the, quote, reserve battalions were raised. Now, we mentioned these in the last episode, and they were the formations that were made up of the men who had been called up, trained and released under the Crumper system to maintain the 40,000 man cap on members of the Prussian army, forced on to them by the one-sided Treaty of Tilsit. Instantly, 39 battalions of infantry sprang up from seemingly nowhere, all trained and drilled, not perhaps to the same standard as the regulars, but it's much, much quicker to hone the existing skills of recently trained troops than it is to train new troops from scratch. That's not to say that they didn't do this as well, and taking their cue from Austria, on the 17th of March 1813, a Landwehr was formed of those too old, too young, weak or otherwise not trained to the standards of the reserve battalions. Now something which I don't want to spend too much time on, but I include here out of a sense of completeness, were the various free corps, perhaps the most famous of which was one raised in February 1813 by Major von Lutzau, of whom we'll have a talk about later. Basically, these free corps were bands of irregulars raised usually by a wealthy individual or a town. I think sort of like Spanish guerrillas, but, you know, without the viciousness. And like the guerrilla war bands in Spain, these free corps could end up as small armies in their own right. So the, uh, the Lutzau contingent we mentioned earlier on eventually was made up of 2,900 infantry, 600 cavalry and 120 artillerymen so i mean that's that's not about it you know if you wanted to collect a small army then that's a nicely self-contained army that you've got right there anyway anyway back to the reserve battalions so they were attached to a parent regular regiment who provided their officers and ncos and this further bloated the size of the 12 prussian regiments each now consisting of two musketeer battalions and one fusilier battalion, at least one reserve battalion, and an attached reserve regiment and any associated landwehr. While uniforms were the same for the line battalions and their reservist auxiliaries in theory, there were a lot of supply problems, with them even using British-made uniforms. So again, there's an opportunity for a bit of uh, painting conversion work there. The iconic parts of the, uh, the landwehr were the ankle-length greatcoat slung over one shoulder in summer, and that provided some protection against sabres and long-range musketry. Uh, a shako, which was ordered to be covered with its oil skin at all times, which I think is a bit of a shame, uh, but they are quite cool under the oil skin. They've got a very unique shape, and that's provided by the pom-pom that was at the front. Finally, they wore the iconic dark blue double-breasted collet jacket, with different coloured facings depending on the regiment. Now one thing I've heard is contrasting information about is that units would often have a white circle on their shako covers. I talk about this in um, the getting started with the Prussian army video but I thought I'd had it, add it here as well in case you've not had a chance to see that or you're just interested in the history videos. Uh, now I've heard that these white circles denoted fusilier battalions, so they're the, the light infantry, the skirmishers. But I've also heard that it represented field battalions, so that's not the reserves where troops would be trained and then sent into the field battalions. Given that the Prussians very rarely had non-field battalions in their regiments, that would mean that everyone on the battlefield gets one. Personally, for me, if I was doing a Prussian army, as I said in the uh, start collecting video, I'd paint them just on the fusiliers, that would help them stand out on the tabletop, and it saves you having to buy the upgrade sprues. Now, of course, if you want to, that's great, but it's just a, a way of not having to spend the extra money. Now, of course, the other great identifier for units, battalions, and regiments in the Napoleonic Wars is the flags that they carry. In this period, they did away with the two colours per battalion, uh, 
for the single one. Now, despite having written this phonetically, I'm still going to pronounce it horrendously, so apologies in advance. But their single flag, the Avankiafan. This is surely at least partly as a response to them losing 360 colours in 1806. <laughs> After all, the enemy can't capture 360 flags if you're not carrying 360. Now, there's a lot of debate out there uh, amongst wargamers and historians about which flags were carried by which Prussian units, how many, and all this stuff. F uh, I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, for me, I like battalions with two flags. That's why I love my Russians so much. So I'd I'd go for two. But um, yeah, I, I I wouldn't if you just model them with one flag, then I don't think you could be accused of being wrong. To be honest, in contrast, the Landwehr were not. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I said earlier on that the, it was the Landwehr uniforms I was talking about. There was the line one. So sorry. In contrast to the line, the Landwehr were not armed and equipped by the Central Army, but by their local provinces. While the soldier was expected to equip himself, it soon fell to their state or province to clothe them. After all, personal and uh, regional honour and prestige are at stake here. And this practice continued long after the Napoleonic period, even after the unification of Germany. Uh, I've seen in the Imperial War Museum in London, there's uh, some really nice sky blue First World War French uniforms. I don't think they're Bavarian, though. I know Bavarians did wear blue in 1914. But, um, yeah, anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, a huge uh, tangent there. Um, now, due to this, the second or third line role that the Landwehr had, these men were expected to undertake that they were not particularly lavishly equipped, to say the least. In Napoleon at War, the historian Lorraine Petrie wrote, uh, it's quite a long one, this quote, a decree of the king established the Landwehr based on the model of that of Austria in 1809. As the impoverished state of Prussian finances precluded much assistance from the state, the expense of the equipment had to fall on the men themselves or their villages. At first, the front rank was often armed with pikes or scythes, and it was only as French muskets were taken from the battlefields that the men were armed with yet another pattern of firearm. There was a great dearth of officers, as most of the half-pay officers still fit for service were required in the reserve battalions. All sorts of officials, many of them unsuitable as military officers, joined, and it was only later on that men of some experience were got from the volunteer Jaegers, etc. Naturally, the Landwehr as a whole was at first of no great military value, though their initial worth was in some corps, Yorks and Bulaus especially, enhanced by the long marches and still more by early successes." End quote. Despite this lack of equipment, one thing that they could provide was numbers in both infantry and cavalry. Divided between these six brigades, quote, we talked about um, in the last episode that the brigades were in fact much, much bigger than what we think of. Uh, but divided between these six brigades were 149 battalions of Landwehr infantry and 113 squadrons of cavalry. Of these, 68 battalions and 40 squadrons were in the Silesian Brigade, which is by far the largest contingent. This massive ramping up of forces did cause some other problems, though, notably the provision of weapons, a problem eased by the provision of 113,000 muskets by the British. Most of these, though, were hogged by the regular army, and that required the Landwehr to make do with the French muskets given to them by the Russians after they had scooped them up during the retreat from Moscow. The Prussian general staff were keen that while the Landwehr were to be drilled, in July 1813, General Kraft told the officers of the Newmark Landwehr to concentrate on, quote, the main and essential points, advancing, retiring, forming columns, movement in columns, forming squares, deploying, rallying, and charging, end quote. In an almost revolutionary step, he also suggested that they issue ammunition to their sharpshooters to allow for target practice. There were those that were concerned that too rigorous a training regimen, however, might damage the Landwehr, sapping their patriotic fervour. One such was friend of the channel and Napoleonic figure, Sean Horst, and another was General Putlitz, who wrote that the officers and NCOs should not be too strict on the men, so they, quote, do not grow to hate this service. Officers must never be allowed to forget that they have to deal with people of whom several have volunteered for the defence of the fatherland. In this regard, one must always use self-respect. End quote. The typical Landwehr uniform was designed for function and serviceability, not show, often being no more than an overcoat. The outfit, while plain, was easy to manufacture in a nation without a massive weaving industry. Oh, it wasn't too bad in East Prussia, actually. 
essential when they were necessary to outfit entire battalions at once. One major problem was that they often used civilian grade clothes and equipment, for want of a better word, and they were entirely unsuited to the rigours of campaign life. At best, or perhaps worst, example of this was in footwear, which often didn't fit and could be sucked off by deep mud. As each Landveer recruit was only issued a single pair, they could well be barefoot for the rest of the campaign. If you're marching from, I don't know, Berlin to Paris in no shoes, then uh, <laughs> that's, that's quite a long way. The rule freshly raised in black powder could almost have been written solely for the Landveer, as their combat effectiveness varied greatly. Digby Smith writes, quote, The Prussian Landveer received their baptism of fire at Lohenberg. The Schiewiednitz Battalion braved canister fire and threw the enemy back at the point of a bayonet. They were only taken out of the line when they ran out of ammunition, and when they marched past York, he had his line regiments present arms to them. He continues, Blücher wrote, and now he's uh, quoting Blücher, At first it was only so-so with the Landveer battalions, but now that they've had a good taste of powder, they are as good as the line battalions, end quote. Napoleon, however, had a very different opinion of them. When he saw some captured Landveer, he wrote, quote, The enemy infantry is absolutely wretched. This encourages me, end quote. Troops quality really seems to have been almost completely random, with some units performing well and others poorly, and this has almost no bearing on whether they were thought that they, was, that they were going to behave well or badly, uh, which is why I think that the freshly raised rules are absolutely perfect for them. And I guess, you know, that's a good uh, representation of a regular formed infantry. They're, they're a bit weird. They're not like the guerrillas of the Spanish. They are formed infantry. They fight as formed infantry, but they are irregulars. So it's an interesting uh, estuary there between... Uh, what, line troops and reserve troops. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Anyway, anyway. One troop that we've not really covered so far in any of the parts of these videos are the Jaegers. And that's because there were only one regiment in 1806. And by 1813, there was still only one regiment. But there were numerous so-called volunteer Jaeger companies. They were around about 100, 150 men each. And these are attached to each line regiment. You actually get them in the... Uh, Perry Prussian Infantry Box. Germany and Prussia have a long tradition of hunting, and these Jaegers were often formed of outdoor types and woodsmen, and would have an assortment of weaponry. Most commonly, very well-made civilian rifles. Not only well-made, but very well-maintained civilian rifles. Petrie wrote that they were, quote, young men of independent means, of from 17 to 24 years, and equipped and armed at their own expense, or that of the neighbourhood. They were those who did not already belong to the army and had no sufficient cause for exemption. Their numbers are uncertain, but they probably never exceeded 5,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry, and 500 artillery and engineers. Their morale was probably greater than their military value, though later they formed good schools for the training of officers and unter-officers in supplying whom there was considerable difficulty." End quote. So again, it allowed these young noblemen to get some experience and then when they were promoted into the regular battalions they already had a bit of training and experience and i think crucially as well uh, i put this in the video i did on the 95th rifles they had a bit of independent thought as well now that's something that wasn't necessarily that common in the napoleonic wars but as the wars went on and light infantry became more useful the idea of independent thought independent decision making things like that on a smaller level you know, the junior officers, lieutenants, captains became a lot more important. The guard, the Prussian guard, also underwent significant change, with two light cavalry regiments being formed from four units of single squadrons to make the guard light cavalry. These squadrons had originally been the guard dragoons, hussars, Cossacks, weirdly, and Uhlans. The heavy cavalry arm, the guard du corps, were formed in 1741, but only now were issued with cuirasses. These were ones captured from French carabineers, so they'd have been made out of brass, and they must have looked pretty swish, I must say. After the campaign in France, the Tsar was to present them with black Russian ones, which, although it's pretty cool in of themselves, and it's a very nice gift, it's not quite the same, is it? Having a black carass is nowhere near as funky as having a shiny brass one. But anyway, under their armour, the Garde de Corps wore white coats with two bands of white lace, which was silver for officers. This is a bit of an aside, but as a general rule, if you're painting figures and you're not sure uh, 
what colour to do the braiding for officers. If it's grey or white on the line troops, then it'll be silver. If it's yellow, then it's gold. That's not always the case, but it's a good rough guide. But anyway, anyway, another digression. Back to the uh, the Prussians. They also wore the standard cavalry helmet, the Garde de Corps, which is the same as everyone else's. Uh, you know, there's the regular line Karaziers. Uh, but obviously it was of a higher standard. The Guard Infantry Regiments were actually numbered as part of the line, and the 8th Regiment was taken out of the list of line and added to the new guard formation, becoming the 1st Regiment of Foot Guard. So having looked at the different elements of the army and their makeup, I'd like to pause here and look at the construction of the Prussian army, so the formations that made it up. Now, Prussian formations at brigade and divisional level were much bigger than their French or Russian counterparts, actually usually being like the next step up. So I think that's best illustrated with an example. I've, I've mentioned it before in this video, and we talked about it in the last one, but I've got a solid example here. At Leipzig, the Prussian 12th Brigade, so this is a brigade, which in the French army would consist usually of two regiments, each of three battalions by this point. So you're looking around six battalions, um, they'd be part of a division, with another brigade, so 12 battalions in a division, perhaps some artillery in there as well. So that's a French division. A Prussian brigade is, uh, at Leipzig, was uh, two regiments of line infantry, the 2nd Silesian infantry, and the 11th reserve infantry, each of which had three battalions, the, the regular two musketeer and one fusiliers. They also had two battalions of the 10th Silesian Landwehr, in addition to the infantry, there were four squadrons of the Silesian Uhlans, one or two squadrons of Silesian Landwehr cavalry, and a battery of eight foot guns. So, one of the great things about this for us as wargamers is that with eight battalions of infantry, one and a half regiments of cavalry, and two batteries of guns, collecting a Prussian brigade is another way that you can get that nicely self-contained army. And it allows the Napoleonic collector to set themselves quite an achievable goal. And, that, and that's not always uh, possible with uh, with Napoleonics. So that's not something to be scoffed at. You can actually say, I'm going to collect, in this case, the Prussian 12th Brigade, and you've got yourself a decent-sized army there. Now, speaking of cavalry, as we were, the regiments of cavalry available to Prussia in 1813 were also limited by the Convention of Paris. And in fact, that the Crumper system was less effective with them because they were much more of a skilled branch. That said, Landwehr cavalry units made up a significant portion of the cavalry, being some 30 regiments, and these were primarily lancers. Peter Hoff Schroer, a historian, wrote, quote, The Landwehr cavalry were given lancers in imitation of the Cossacks. Lack of training in their use must have made them fairly ineffective in a battlefield role, end quote. This must have been especially the case when they were up against Polish or even French line lancers. One regiment of note, however, is the East Prussian National Cavalry Regiment. Not particularly for any daring do that they achieved, but because they were raised in February 1813, which was before the government even ordered the raising of the Landwehr. So there's a little bit of, uh, of uh, extra training that those guys could do. Now, cavalry regiments for the Prussians were pretty big. Four squadrons with a paper strength of about 150. In reality, only half of those numbers would be achieved. But there's still a case to have them as large regiments in term of, terms of black powder, I think. The line cavalry were as good a horseman as they were in 1806. And while their mounts were not the best, or you know, even okay-ish, to be honest, because those had all been stolen by the French... Uh, and then eaten on the way back from <laughs> the retreat from Moscow. Uh, but despite those limitations, they were still quite a strong force. However, the Prussians, for all their advancements and modernization since 1806, never really got to grips with the use of modern cavalry, you know, modern in the, the terms of 1813. Despite being good riders, and later having excellent mounts, and being equipped with some of the best equipment in Europe at the time, they never really used a cavalry reserve, and what I mean by a cavalry reserve is where units of heavy cavalry, carassiers, heavy dragoons, are massed together to deliver that knockout blow. Think the Union Brigade at Waterloo, or, I mean, any number of French carassier divisions, really. Rather, the Prussians parceled their cavalry out into individual brigades as support for the infantry, as we saw in that breakdown of the 12th Brigade. Um, 
I mean, I, I guess it makes those units more immediately available for a Prussian commander. You know, if you need cavalry right now, you don't have to wait for them to show up. But it does mean that it was very difficult for the Prussians to deliver that crushing hammer blow that, uh, that, you know, that I certainly love narrating in these videos. Or even to uh, shore up a gap that the French were pushing through. Especially as they routinely found themselves outnumbered by these reserve brigades of French cavalry. If you've got, you know, uh, four or five hundred uh, Prussian Karaziers, doesn't matter how good they are if the French have got 2,000 coming back at you. So, there's pluses and there's minuses of it. And, in fact, the, the Prussian cavalryman was maybe a little too well disciplined as well. The, there needs to be a, a sense of dash, of daring do for the cavalry, of achieving the what was believed to be unachievable. But regulations of 1812 specifically forbade Prussian cavalry from galloping off and doing its own thing, but refer to it as a close support element for the infantry to support any local breakthroughs. Perhaps the very early germination of cavalry and infantry in close support doctrines, and, you know, these would pay off in, you know, the Blitzkrieg years, I guess, but uh, maybe this is the very genesis of it. I think, though, it was less successful than the cavalry reserve. But, you know, I mean, that, that's up for debate if you disagree. If you've got examples of how it really works effectively, please let me know in the comments. I'd be fascinated to, uh, to see them. There was also, again, with the cavalry, you talked about the heavy cavalry reserve there. There was also a consistent lack of light cavalry. And that hindered intelligence gathering of four suppressions to fight more than one arguably inadvised battle. I know we talked about there being tons of land veer cavalry, and they are light cavalry, but they're not trained in the art of scouting or of uh, putting out pickets, things like that. The French light cavalry, again, some of the best in the world, possibly the best in the world, very good at stopping the enemy from gathering intelligence on you while they're gathering the intelligence on the enemy. One of these ill-advised battles was in uh, took place in May 1813 near the Thirty Years' War battlefield of Lutzen. Believing that Napoleon would be his weakest soon after the disaster in Russia, the Prussians and Russians advanced into Germany. And while they were partly correct, the Emperor had rushed 200,000 reinforcements to bolster the remnants of the Grand Armée. Though numerous, these men were raw, and the finer arts of soldiering, especially reconnaissance, weren't up to the levels they'd previously been. And it was because of this that Ney's corps, the last to leave Russia, was isolated and attacked by the combined Russian army of Wittgenstein and the Prussian one of Blücher. Napoleon ordered the bravest of the brave to fall back and fortify the village of Lutzen and await further reinforcements, while the rest of the army set a trap to encircle the attacking allies. One scene of note in that battle was that, as was the case for many of the battles in 1813 Germany, a number of small fortified villages formed the French position. And against one such, Rana, King Frederick Wilhelm III personally led his foot guards as they stormed and occupied the village. Now, I'd love to see a regiment of Prussian guards of fuss modelled with the king at the front leading them forward. I think that would be really cool. If I ever do a Prussian guard, that's definitely how I'm modelling my battalion. A counter-attack on the main Allied line by the Imperial Guard, the French Imperial Guard this time, following a 100-cannon barrage forced them back. It was at this battle that our Napoleonic figure von Scharnhorst received the wound that would fester and eventually kill him. Although the Allies were defeated, the Prussian cavalry at least wasn't up to much. Neither were the French, and the lack of pursuit meant that 18 days later, another battle at Bautzen would be fought, again resulting in a French win, but with heavy losses. So heavy, in fact, that an armistice was signed that lasted until August and the Battle of Dresden. Here at Dresden, the Prussians performed well, fighting on their home soil, but they were very much the junior partner to the Russians and the Austrians. One incident of note was that the first Silesian hussars pushed back, albeit momentarily the young guard, until they were driven off by guard cannon fire. Despite the French winning the battle, losses for the Prussians weren't too bad, and even in pursuit, while men were lost, it was not a massacre. The Prussian guard reported losing an average of 10 men per company in the retreat, and while the Prussians would also be defeated at Bautzen, which had Ney attacked the Allied right instead of the centre, that would have crushed the Allied armies. So they were allowed to get away from one of Ney's mistakes. We may, uh, <laughs> we may come into those a bit later on. Spoiler. 
In September 1813, the Prussians would have their first victory as a senior partner over the French under Marshal Ney, reinforced by Marshal Oudinot at the Battle of Danowitz. There were some teething troubles for the Prussian army of General von Bülow in this uh, battle, though. For example, the 5th Kermark Landwehr was skirmishing in front of the Prussian lines and, having fired off all their ammunition, fell back, disordering the line troops behind them. And their cavalry, the Prussian cavalry, were driven off by numerically inferior chasseurs, French chasseurs. But overall, the army performed pretty well. They launched a huge attack in the centre, which the Prussians were able to stop with a judicious use of reserves, and in the aftermath, the Prussian cavalry, with some Russian help, managed to capture or kill between five and 10,000 men. Losses were so high that Oudinot's corps was broken up, its men sent as reinforcements to the other corps. This victory ended any chance of Napoleon advancing on Berlin and allowed the Prussians to concentrate on the offensive, showing that the Prussian army had come of age. There were other teething troubles, though, at Leipzig, the Prussians and Russians attempted to form a Grand Battery, consisting of some 54 pieces, which was overlooked by the French position on Gallows Hill. Upon this hill, General Drouot had formed his own Grand Battery, and no one put the Grand in Grand Battery like Drouot, with 100 guns, including the 12-pounders of the Imperial Guard. Within seconds, he had destroyed over 20 Allied guns and killed countless crew and horse teams. Soon, the Allied artillery was routed, leaving the Russian infantry to face the wrath of the French cannons. There were positives, though, as when two Landwehr battalions found themselves attacked by French cavalry, they formed square and staved them off until Russian carassiers could literally ride to the rescue, proving that the Landwehr were more than the unorganised mob that Napoleon had them tagged as, but could complete complex manoeuvres, such as forming a square, in the face of the enemy, so that's not to be sniffed at. After the defeat at Leipzig, Napoleon began to withdraw to reinforce his men, but the Prussians provided them no respite. The army of Silesia under General Gebhard von Blücher, forcing him to fight at Mockern. Now, we actually modified and filmed that battle for the channel. We replaced the Prussians with uh, General Andy's Austrians. And, uh, yeah, so we've got the Battle of Mock earn because it's more yeah, anyway uh, <laughs> and it was on the battle of mock earn on the bloody field of which 62 year old commander of the army of silesia general gerhard von blucher was made into prussia's first field marshal in nearly half a century making him de facto supreme russian commander this was the fourth time blucher had faced off against napoleon and the first time that he had beaten him with this victory, the war now moved to French soil, and Blücher crossed the Middle Rhine on the 29th of December 1813. He would be brought to battle by Napoleon near Brienne. This was France's home soil, and Napoleon knew the terrain very, very well. As a nine-year-old child, he had entered the Royal School of Brienne and stayed there for five and a half years, often doing military exercises in the surrounding area. Here, despite a tactical victory, the Emperor was unable to stop Blücher's column from joining up with the Austrian army of Karl Philipp, better known by his title, the Prince of Schwarzenberg. One incident in the battle that's worth going into was that as the night began to fall, Blücher and his Chief of Staff von Gneisnau assumed that the fighting was over, it's night time, we're not going to fight at night, and so returned to the chateau in which they were quartered behind the Prussian lines. Unfortunately for them, Marshal Victor didn't get the memo, and about 400 soldiers of the 37th and the 56th line regiments, under the very aptly named Louis Huguet Chateau, actually briefly captured the house that the Prussian generals were in. Luckily for the Allies, a Russian counterattack drove them off. <laughs> Again, I think this is making an absolutely amazing skirmish game, as the uh, French are fighting the personal guard of the senior commander in the rooms of the chateau itself. I'm not sure that actually happened. I think they were probably stopped outside. But uh, that, that would be a cool, cool skirmish scenario. Certainly not helped by this near miss. By this time, von Blücher had become to hate the French with an absolutely burning rage. While a leading advocate for the reform of the army, but personally, he was a Prussian of the old school, and with that contempt for anything that wasn't a Prussian soldier. He once said, quote, May the pens of the diplomats not ruin again what the people have attained with such exertions. End quote. His hatred of the French was such that I have read that the Prussians committed more atrocities on the local French population than the Cossacks. I don't know how true that is, but you know, I've only read it once. Certainly, Blücher was no fan of the French, though. Known as Marshal Forwards, 
He had turned the Prussians from the static firing lines of precision drill in 1806 to the shock troops of the Allied armies in only eight years. His policy was swift, bold attack, a policy which would influence German military thinking for the next 150 years, and the army of Silesia would march harder and fight harder than any other Prussian formation. Nowhere would it need to fight harder than at La Rothier, where, in the January snows, the Emperor fought to stop the Allies from reaching Paris. In front of his King Frederick Wilhelm III and the Austrian and Russian Emperors, von Blücher won a victory that would send Napoleon to Fontainebleau and allow the Allies to advance on the capital. His final victory outside the city would be on the 9th of March at Lyon. But there the old man, after years of hard campaigning, suffered a nervous breakdown, though he was recovered enough to lead the final attack on Paris itself. It is noticeable at this time there was a major weakness in the Prussian army, and that was one of a unified command. Now, usually unified command would be a positive thing. Wellington had a similar philosophy. He was in charge, all the decisions went through him. That's fine, even preferable when that one figure is able to make those decisions. Take him out of the picture though, and suddenly units become disorganised. And here, the, where the death blow was needed to be struck, the Allies encircled the French capital, the Silesian Brigade was crippled. Whilst brilliantly assisted by Gneisenau, the commander was Blücher. However, luckily the French were defeated, and due to Blücher's quick recovery, no major damage was caused. Obviously, the French would suffer this problem at Waterloo as well. This unified command, this single vision, it's great, but when it's taken out of the equation, then everything can go wrong. I'd recommend, if you're going to do this battle, that you roll a dice, maybe on a 1 at the start of every turn, Blücher takes ill, and then everyone's strategy rating drops 1. That would be my recommendation. You'd also lose your command reroll as well. It should be quite punishing for the Prussians to lose their, their commander, in my opinion. Anyway, after the victory at the Battle of Montmartre, as it was known, Tsar Alexander, the senior commander of the Allies, staged a triumph, very much in the way that Napoleon did down Unter den Linden only eight years earlier. Leading the procession were the Prussian Guard cavalry, and at the rear came the Prussian Guard infantry. With the enemy capital in Allied hands, Blücher's hatred for the French came to the fore. According to Wellington, Blücher had wanted to blow up the Yenna Bridge to erase his earlier shame. The 19th century historian Stanhope wrote an anecdote of the Duke about this desire in his book Conversations with the Duke of Wellington, which I would highly recommend. He said, quote, About blowing up the bridge of Yenna, there were two parties in the Prussian army, Gneis now and muffling against it, but Blücher violently for it. In spite of all I could do, he did make the attempt, even while I believe my sentinel was standing at one end of the bridge. But the Prussians had no experience of blowing up bridges. We, who had blown up so many in Spain, could have done it in five minutes. The Prussians made a hole in one of the pillars, but their powder blew out instead of up, and I believe hurt some of their own people, end quote. <laughs> so they, they, they had a go, I guess is the best we could say about that. The Prussians were not popular with the Parisians, even less so than the British. They much preferred the dashing and exotic Russians. However, one other incident which I think worth mentioning is that after bidding farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau, the Russian and Prussians lined the road to Paris as a guard of honour. French General Bordsoul, riding ahead, ordered the Prussian 30th Dragoon Regiment to draw their sabres and present arms. He was curtly told by their colonel, If my dragoons draw their sabres, sir, it is to charge. As the army of Silesia became an army of occupation, Napoleon had been defeated, and Europe would now be at peace. Swords could be turned into plowshares, and Blücher, recovering from his nervous breakdown, retired to Prussia and his newly granted states with the title of prince. The old man could enjoy his last few years of peace. But Napoleon wasn't finished yet, and von Blücher would be summoned one last time. So thank you very much for listening. That's part three of our deep dive into the Prussian army. Uh, we'll be doing part four, hopefully around about the new year, end of December, start of January. We'll get the, the Prussians bottom then. Don't forget, if you're uh, watching this in December, I am running a competition. I'm going to put a link in the description down below to the original video and the advent calendar. What I'm doing is every day in December, as you would expect from a normal advent calendar, you click on the window, it opens, and there's a still from a film set in the Napoleonic era and all you've got to do is name all the films like I said I've, I'm going to leave a link to the sort of the introduction to this advent calendar competition in the link below 
It's for a fantastic prize, a copy of Warlord Games' Waterloo starter set and Albion Triumphant Volume 2 to go with it. So please take part, even if you're not uh, intending on entering the competition. Just have a look at the advent calendar, it's a bit of fun. Uh, and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll see you and your entry to that. But either way, I shall see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.